I've done a lot of thinking, I've done a lot of uh, pondering the last couple of weeks. We're, we're making our way into the final days of the year 2021. And I don't know about you, but that's amazing because this, this year has flown by. And I know the older you get, it seems time passes quicker. A lot of people will make New Year's resolutions. A lot of people will begin thinking into the future, thinking about what 2022 holds. And I think that's a good thing, that we should look forward to the future, that we should plan ahead for the future. I'll be 43 years old in January, less than a, a month and away, and, and I've been doing a lot of reflection on my life, and a lot of looking forward and a lot of thinking about the future. And I think it's important that we not only reflect back on 2021 to see what we could do differently, to see what we could correct, to see what we could allow God to do in our lives, but I think it's also important to reflect not just on the past year, but to reflect over the course of our lifetime. Because there's one thing, as, as a 42-year-old young man, there's, there's one thing that I want, and I want my life to count. And I'm assuming everybody in the sanctuary this morning wants the same thing. You want your life to count. God didn't just put you here on this earth. He didn't just create you and save you to exist your way through life. If you're like me, you want your life to count. When you leave this earth, you want to leave a mark for Christ, and you want your life to count. As I watched my family interact yesterday, I want my life to count. I want how I live my life, how I go about living my life. I want my life to count for my wife. I want my life to count for my daughters. I want my life to count for my son. I don't want to waste my life. And for that to be done, we have to go about living life very intentionally. So there's times where we have to reflect back on the year, back over the course of our life, and look forward to seeing what God wants to do in our lives in the future. Because listen, at the end of the day, all that truly matters is that my life truly counts in the grand scheme of of eternity. You understand that? At the end of the day, all that, truly, all that truly matters in my life, all that truly matters in your life, in the grand scheme of eternity, is that it counts. So today's message to you, to end this year out, so to speak, on a Sunday, is about making it count. Come on, does anybody want to make their life count? on this earth. And the thing is, we don't know how long we have to make it count. So that's, it's, that's why it's important to, to live every second, every minute, every hour, every day with intentionality and with purpose because when God calls us home, when we breathe our last breath, we want our life to count. And there's another person in the Bible that wanted his life to count. We're going to read about that this morning. If you would, if you have your Bibles, and hopefully you do, take Take it and turn with me to the New Testament book of Philippians. Y'all see my new Bible I got? Huh? The proud owners of that demonic dog that ate my other Bible. Man, they felt bad and bought me a really nice Bible. And now I'm going to work my way through it. Philippians chapter 3. Go ahead and stand to your feet, if you would, in the, uh, in the reading of, of God's Word. Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to be reading from the, from the ESV version this morning. So everybody is there, say, I'm there. If you don't have your Bibles, it'll be on the screen for you. Philippians chapter 3, we're going to begin with verse 1. It says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Now, now to me, I'm going to stop right there. It really doesn't have much to do with the message. But it's funny in Philippians chapter 3 that Paul's saying, finally, my brothers. And yet he goes on another chapter and, and whatnot. That's kind of, I guess, a preacher thing. Y'all know it's like, hey, we're about to wrap up. And then we end up wrapping up like three or four times. So I guess Paul struggled with it as well. But he's saying, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Verse 2, look out for the dogs. (laughs) 
it's, it's, it, it's ironic that he's saying this because the Gentiles were referred to as dogs. And Paul, being a Jew, is calling Jewish people, some of them, these, these Judaizers, these legalists, these people that said you have to become Jewish first before you become Christians, he, he's insulting them. He's talking a little smack. Watch out for those dogs. Those evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the, fle- the flesh. Another very strong word here. For we are the circumcision. We who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, uh, eighth day according to... The Levitical law, that's what the Jewish boy was supposed to do. Of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, super important. The tribe of Benjamin was extremely important because the first king of Israel came from the tribe of Benjamin. Does anybody remember who the first king of Israel was? Saul. It's interesting that Paul's name was Saul before he came Paul. Maybe he was named after King Saul, I don't know. He says this, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But for whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake, I suffered the loss of of all things and count them as rubbish. Another extremely strong word in the original, it literally means human dung. Extremely important. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know Him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Verse 12, not that I've already obtained this, or I'm already perfect. Is anybody still under construction? Anybody still got a ways to go? Paul knew it too. But he said, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on. Say, press on. on. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. How about an amen to the reading of God's Word this morning? You may be seated. Making it count. Again, I thought it was fitting to wrap up this last Sunday of the year to make the final days of 2021 count. That we just don't ease our way through the remainder of the year. That we just don't exist our remaining days of 2021 before 2022 gets here, but bigger than that, in the larger scheme of things, I want not only the remaining days of this year to count, but I want the remainder of my life. I want it to count, and you should want it to count, and the Apostle Paul wants it to count. So I'm going to take this passage of Scripture that we just read. We're going to break it down a little bit. We're going to pull out some spiritual truths and nuggets, and hopefully you can leave today and apply it to your life. So number one is this. Sometimes, listen, sometimes it's the good things in life that can keep us from truly making life count. Now, a lot of times we think it's the bad things in life that keep life from truly counting, and that's the obvious But how many of you understand sometimes it's the good things, it's the subtle things, the deceptive things that Satan uses to get us distracted? Listen, Paul's saying here, nothing, 
Nothing in this world compares to the worth of knowing Jesus Christ. Do we understand that this morning? Nothing you could attain in this world, nothing that this world has to offer us, nothing compares to the worth of knowing Jesus Christ. And sometimes these things aren't necessarily bad things, they're good things that can keep us or hinder us from the best things, from the eternal things, from the most important thing, which is knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. And to prove that, I want to go back and, and look, of, look at what the Apostle Paul was listing in Philippians chapter 3. Listen to this. Paul had some good things, but these good things were hindering him from knowing the best things. It was hindering from him knowing the only one and true God. So sometimes it's the good things that hinder us from making our life truly count. Listen to what Paul had. First of all, Pat, Paul had family heritage. Listen, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. People ha uh, Paul had a spiritual pedigree that most people would envy that most people would long for. And again, there's nothing wrong with having family heritage, especially if it's a spiritual one. That's what we're all shooting for. I want to have a, a family legacy. I want to leave something for my family so that future generations can know Christ. I want my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren to know Christ. So in and of itself, Family heritage is a good thing, and the Apostle Paul said that, look, I'm from the people of Israel, the very chosen people. More specifically, he had not only family heritage, look, he had social status. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. Not only do I come from a great family heritage, I'll narrow it down just a little bit more. Specifically, I come from an extremely elite and important tribe, the tribe of Benjamin. Again, as a matter of fact, the very first king of Israel that stood head and shoulders above everybody else, King Saul, came from the tribe of Benjamin. And some of us have great family heritage. Some of us have great social status. We have name in the community. We have prominence in the community. When our last name is mentioned, people recognize it and realize what we've come from or who we've come from. And Paul had these things. He had family heritage. He had social status. But listen, as he continues to name off the things that, some of it that he inherited, some of it came through birthright, but some of it came from his own convictions and from some of his own efforts. Listen, he goes on to say, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, and listen, as to the law of Pharisee. Now, a lot of us, when we hear the word Pharisee, because a lot of the accounts in the gospel, we always, we automatically go to a negative connotation, right? We even say that in the church world. Well, they're, they're a bunch of Pharisees. But look, the Pharisees in the day were an elite group of people. Actually, Pharisee, the word means separated ones. There was no more than maybe 6,000 Pharisees. They were the spiritual elite. They were the religious elite. People had great respect for them. So it wasn't necessarily a negative thing. Being a Pharisee in the day was actually a very positive thing. People looked up to them. People respected them. And Paul said, look, I was a Pharisee. In other words, I was very religious. And not just that, he said, I was very zealous, a persecutor of the church. He was very passionate. He was very zealous. Is there anything wrong about being passionate when it comes to religion, about being zealous when it comes to religion. The apostle Paul, or Saul, was extremely zealous and extremely passionate doing, going about what he thought was religiously right. Again, family heritage, good thing. Social status, good thing. Being religious, good thing. Being zealous, 
Good thing, right? And then listen, he goes on to say, as to righteousness under the law, listen, blameless. Paul had moral behavior. As to the law, he was righteous. He had good moral behavior. He had it all together. Again, good things, family heritage, social status, religious, zealous, and moral behavior. But all of these good things prevented him from knowing the main thing. They actually prevented him from knowing the one, the Christ. And sadly, I think in our culture, in our religious culture, especially in our American culture and our Western culture, a lot of good things can keep us, can hinder us from knowing Christ. We automatically go to the bad things. Well, he's a drunk, or well, he's an alcoholic, or he's unforgiven, or he's this or this, or he's full of anger, or he's full of jealousy. These bad things that are very obvious that can hinder us from knowing Christ. But church, I'm telling you today that the enemy is extremely deceptive and he can use the good things to keep us from knowing Christ. Because there's a lot of good people that are extremely religious. They come to church, which is what? It's not a bad thing. They give the tithe, not a bad thing. They give offerings. If we, if we come up here and say, hey, we need, we need this amount of money for a mission. We just need this amount of money to, to help Dr. Tim Todd with some Bibles. We need this amount of money to help this family need, and they may be the first to give. All very good things. And there's people that are very religious, people that are even very zealous, people that are actually morally good. People that aren't bad, they don't lie, steep. They don't dip and chew and date girls that do. They're pretty morally good people. But folks, being good in and of itself can actually be the very things that keep us from knowing Christ. And here was a guy that had it all. When it came to family heritage, when it came to social status, when it came to being zealous, being passionate, being morally good, the Apostle Paul, he had it going on. But we have to remember the Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy. Listen to what 1 John chapter 2 verses 15 through 17 says. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, think of all the things, guys, that, that this world has to offer us and that's so appealing to our flesh. All that is in the world, listen, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, look, all of that goes back to the garden. Satan's been using the very same tactic since the beginning of time. Listen, he says, none of that's from the Father, but is from the world, and the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Here's the interesting thing. When the Apostle Paul was radically converted in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts, listen, Paul was willing to lose it all in order to gain what really counts in life. And I know this is a heavy, a heavy message to kind of end the year on, but it's a message that I, I want to share with us, one that I've reflected on myself that we can reflect back through 2021, but more importantly that we be, can become, when we begin uh, looking forward to 2022 and what God would have for our life, reflecting over the course of the past few years of our life, trying to to learn some things, making sure that the life we're living is a life that's truly going to count, because I don't want to come to the end of my days, look back and wonder, did my life really count? Yeah, I had a good family. Yeah, I came from a good name that my daddy gave me. 
Yeah, basically, compared to everybody else, I was a, I was a, a morally, pretty good moral person. I mean, I never killed anybody. But in the grand scheme of things, will I be able to look back and say, you know what? My life really counted for Christ. Something, something more than, than what this world has to offer. My life wasn't lived just superficially. I didn't live my life in a way where everyone can stand up after I die and say, oh, wow, he was, he was a nice person. He was a good person. He, you know, he cared about people, yada, yada, yada. But did his life really count? Did his life really make an eternal impact? Did he leave a mark on this world? Because, guys, that's why we are here. And if there's ever a time when we need to stop and pause and just breathe a little bit from all the fast-paced things going on in life, holidays and all, it just kind of stop over the course of the next few days, maybe the next week, and just stop and reflect upon our lives. And really be honest with ourselves and ask ourselves, is the life I'm living a life that's truly counting for something? I'm not talking about something count where the world's going to applaud me, but when I get to heaven, will heaven rejoice? When I leave this earth, will there be a void in the earth because of my absence here on earth? Because I was living my life in such a way that it truly counted, it truly impacted people, it truly uh, advanced the kingdom of God. Listen to what Jesus said in, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13. Verse 44, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Listen, then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. The treasure was so valuable, it was worth going and selling, losing, so to speak, everything he had in order to attain this treasure, this prize in the field. Look. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. I'm not saying go home today, put your house up for sale, put everything on eBay and Facebook market. No, I'm not talking about that, but I'm, but I'm asking you, are you willing to lose it all for the sake of gaining the one that truly matters? Are you willing to lose it all to make your life truly count? Listen, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, you remember the story of Moses. When he was born, he was hidden for three months by his parents. Now, I can't imagine hiding one of my children for three months. The Bible says that Moses' mother, you know, when he was, he was going around when... Uh, Pharaoh was going around slaughtering all the babies. She knew it, it wasn't just about her baby, but she could tell that the hand of God was on her child, that there was something special about this Moses. There was something that God was going to use in Moses' life to really have an impact on this earth. So look, she hid Moses for three months. It says, because they saw that the child was beautiful. They were not afraid of the king's edict, but by faith, listen, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Amen. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking forward. Remember what Paul wrote, we just read, he was looking forward to the reward by faith he left Egypt not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. Moses had it figured out. In order for his life to count and matter truly for eternity, he was willing to give up everything Everything that he gained, he was willing to give up all the fleeting pleasures of sin so that he could truly gain 
what mattered in life and what mattered in the grand scope of eternity. Listen, number two, the cry of Paul's heart was a couple of things I want us to look at today. The cry of Paul's heart was to know Christ. Talking about making his life count. The cry of Paul's heart was to know Christ. And if we truly want to make our life count, if I want to make my life count, if you want to make your life count, look, the true, the true cry of our heart, church, listen, it must be to know Christ. That must be the greatest cry of our heart, not to succeed in this world, not to, to, to obtain some social status, not to climb the ladder of success, but the cry of our heart must be to know Christ. I want to know Christ and to be made known by Him. And that was it. He experienced all the greatness of this Jewish religion. He had climbed the ladder of success in religion. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. There's nobody that could compare to Saul and what he had attained in the religious world. And yet he got to a place in his life after having known Christ and being made known by Christ, being chosen by Christ as an instrument of his glory. The cry of the Apostle Paul's heart was to go from destroying the church to advancing the church to calling Christ a heretic, to calling Christ the King, to being willing to die for the one that died for him. Listen to the Gospel of John chapter 17. Again, this is the cry of the apostle's heart, to know Christ, and that same, that same desire must become the, the cry of our heart, to know Christ. Because that is the first step in truly making our life matter is to know Christ. That must be the motivating factor in how we live and, and how we go about living life and how we go about viewing life, how we go about viewing people is to know Christ. Listen to what Jesus said in the Gospel of John chapter 17 verse 1. It says, by, did I just read that? I think I did. Let's go down to Ephesians 4, sorry. Ephesians 4 chapter Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, Paul said, and he gave the, some of the apostles, he gave the church the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Listen, why? Listen to what he says. Until we all attain to the unity of faith, and of what? Can y'all read that? And to the knowledge of the Son of God is to know Christ. It, it should be the cry, and leave that up there, not the cry of all of our hearts as individual believers, but more than that, it should be the cry of our heart as a church corporately that the fivefold ministry equip the saints, you guys, to do the work of the ministry until we all come to such unity. It can't happen until that, that happens, until we come to such unity in the faith. Why? And the knowledge of the Son of God. Again, it's not just us knowing Christ individually. It's us as a church knowing Christ corporately. And it, look, it's only until then to mature, to mature to manhood, to the measure of the stature of of the fullness of Christ. Church, Christ wants us as a church to mature, to know Him, to come to the unity of the faith. In other words, to grow up. Amen. But it must, it must be the cry of our heart, not just as believers, but as the church corporately. Paul says, I want to know Christ. And then listen to what he goes on to say. I want to know Christ and the power of what? I may know him, verse 10, and the power of his what? Resurrection. I want to know Christ, but beyond that, I want to know Christ, and I want to know the power of his resurrection. We know about the power in the resurrection, but he says, I want to know Christ and the power of the resurrection. 
church, do we understand as believers, as we know Christ, that we have the Spirit of God, the same Spirit, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, living and breathing in us. And Paul's saying, I want to know Christ, but I also want to know the power of his resurrection. And that same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to us in 2021 today to live victorious lives that truly count for eternity. And that must become the cry of our heart. I want to know Christ, but I want to know the power. I know about the power in the resurrection, but I want to know the power of the resurrection. I want to know how that power affects my life and my being and how I go about living life. Romans 1 verses 1 through 4, Paul says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his, what? Resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6 verse 5 says, For if we have been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him for the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. So when we know Christ and when we know the power of the resurrection, we no longer have to live as slaves to sin because the power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that lives in me. And because that same power lives in me, I don't have to live the way I used to live. I don't have to think the way I used to think. I don't have to talk the way I used to talk. I don't have to be in chains and in bondage to the things that used to hold me in chains and bondage. I can live a new life victorious in Christ because the power of the resurrection I want to know him but I want to know the power of the resurrection listen to second Peter chapter 1 verse 3 it says his divine power is granted to us all the things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, through Christ, who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that, so that through him you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Listen to what, is he, what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, talking about the resurrection. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead... How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, that not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Verse 20, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God to the Father, after destroying every ruler and every authority and every power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Aren't you excited about that? 
His cry was to know Christ. And his cry was to know the power of his resurrection. And this is where it gets interesting. Because all of us, most of us, I'm assuming hopefully all of us, we want to know Christ. Amen? We want to know the power of his resurrection. But this is where the rubber meets the road. Because this is not near as exciting about knowing Christ, about knowing the power of his resurrection. He goes on and says, and may share, may I share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Because if our desire is to know Christ, our desire should also be to know the power of the resurrection. But if we want to be like Christ, it's not just enough to desire to know Him. It's not just enough to desire to know the power of the re- resurrection. If we want to know Christ and be like Christ, then we also our desire must be to also share in Christ's suffering. And that's in 2021 where we check out. Because nobody wants to talk about this. Knowing Christ, knowing the power of his resurrection, but sharing in Christ's sufferings, oh no. That flies in the face of the modern prosperity gospel. How, how am I supposed to fit this in? My theology is what the apostle Paul said. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrections, but I also want to share in Christ's sufferings, being like him. Yeah, we want to be like Christ, and we want to be full of the love of God. Amen. We want to be like Christ and walk in forgiveness. Amen. We want to walk in the power of his resurrection, walking in victory over the power of the enslavement of sin, but I want to be like Christ and share in his sufferings, which means, man, I'm going to have to be rejected. If the world hates you, remember it hates me first, Jesus said. Man, if I share in the sufferings of Christ, that that may mean I have to make a decision between my job and, and something that I'm really convinced and convicted of in Scripture. Oh my goodness, that may affect my family heritage. I may not be accepted by my family. Oh, my social status is right out the door. I may even have the possibility of, of being persecuted. And you see how our believe our brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world, they're truly they're literally sharing in the sufferings of Christ. They are truly identifying in, in the sufferings of Christ. And that was part of the Apostle Paul who literally shared in the sufferings of Christ, who was whipped, who was beaten, who was stoned, who was shipwrecked, who was not clothed very well, on and on and on. But church, if we want to be like Christ, if we want to stop playing religious games, if we want to stop playing, because the day, look guys, look, it's time that we stop playing church, stop playing this fun religious game, stop going through the motions and truly be sold out Christ followers. Because I'm telling you, more now than ever, we got to get serious. I was telling my kids, I was, I was teaching, I was teaching my kid. And there was one of my particular daughters was interacting with another girl from out of state and whatnot. And this particular girl called my daughter, a, her, her, her statement a sexist sounded sexist, which, man, you know, I mean, something was pretty clear in the Bible. I mean, you know, we didn't come up with it. (laughs) Take it up with the Holy Spirit. And I said, look, now more now than ever, guys, look, you have bet, you have better be grounded, rooted and grounded in the Word of God, or you're going to be shifted and shaken by every wind, every form of new doctrine out there. Because when you're not rooted in the Word of God, You're going to be taken astray by this doctrine because it sounds good. It's what my itching ears want to hear, but it's not biblical. It's not rooted in the Word of God. And if there's ever a time, church, we need to be rooted in the Word of God, it's now. 
because their beliefs and ideals and philosophies in this world that have made their way in the church of Jesus Christ and they're being preached across pulpits in America and being embraced by people hook, line, and sinker. I thank God to be a part of a Bible-preaching church. Listen to what he says about sharing in the suffering of Christ. How do y'all like this for a day after Christmas message? Does that make you feel good? He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. Thank God for the comfort of God, huh? So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves has comforted and we've been comforted by God. And it's something you go through something, God comforts you, then you know somebody a year, two years, five years later that goes through something similar, and because God brought you through it and comforted you, now you're able to comfort them. Maybe what you're going through is not just for you, but it's someone that you'll come across in the future. Listen, he says, for as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, So through Christ, we share abundantly in comfort, too. I'm glad when we share in the sufferings of Christ, we also are able to share in the comfort of Christ, too. He doesn't allow us to go through pain without also providing the comfort we need as we experience the pain that we're going through. Listen, if we're afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share, as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to become unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death But that was to make us, listen, to rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. When we're at the mountaintop, when everything's going great in life, it's a little bit more tempting to rely more on ourselves than it is on Christ. Can we be honest? But when you're in the valley, when you're broken, when you're afflicted, when you're suffering, when life has literally beat you to your knees, the only place you have to look up is up. I can't get through this, on, Lord, I need you. When everything's great, when the bank account's full and everybody's healthy, we're getting along, man, I'm doing good. But when life takes your legs out from under you and you hit your face on that ground, you have nowhere to look but up. When we're sharing in the sufferings of Christ, as Paul said, we're more out to rely on Christ who raises the dead. Amen. Luke chapter 9, where am I, where am I, where am I? What did we just read? Y'all paying attention? 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you. Isn't it amazing? Sometimes as Christians, we go through this life, we go through something, and we're like, surprise, God, why are we going through this? What have I done? It's part of life, and it's part of the Christian walk. So the next time you face a trial, don't be surprised. It's called life. It's called your faith journey. And Peter's saying, look, don't be surprised when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share, listen, as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Next time you're insulted by a coworker, or a family man or a friend or somebody in this world, the Bible says you are blessed because the glory of God rests upon you. Don't take it personal. It's not about you. It's about Christ living in you. But let no, none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Man, that God, next time I go through suffering, may, may the Lord help me glorify him instead of complain to him. As Job, who lost literally everything, 
He had an old nagging wife that was trying to get him to hate on God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord giveth. The Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. May, may that be the cry of our heart. Though he slay me, yet I will praise his name. If I lose everything in this world, I still have Christ. If I lose my job, I still have Christ. If I lose my health, I still have Christ. If I'm rejected by friends and families, I still have Christ. If my health fails me, if I lose my job, I still have Christ. And in that, we glorify Him. Number three, the process of becoming like Christ is a lifelong journey. You can't press on into the future if you're constantly distracted by the past. That's why Paul's saying, look, not that I've obtained this, but one thing I do understand, I forget what lies behind me and I press on. Becoming like Christ is a lifelong process. I don't have it together. I'm not even close to having it together. I'm a lot worse than you think I am. And you're not there either. You haven't arrived. You're not the spiritual elite. And Paul's not either. He said this is dying daily, becoming like Christ. It's going to be a lifelong process. And I certainly can't get there. I certainly can't obtain the goal if I'm constantly looking in the rear view mirror. That's why he said I have to stop focusing on the past. When you focus on the past, you're distracting yourself from the future. You can't go back. All you can do is go forward. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, and and, uh, Pastor Brad or Josh, you guys can come. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard, listen to this, he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, listen to this, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Luke 9, verse 62, Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. We look back to reflect, but we don't look back to stay there. We learn from our past, but we don't stay in our past. We learn from our past, but we don't get stuck in our past. We learn from our past, but we don't live in the past. And it's time for some of us moving forward, becoming like like Christ, to stop looking in the past and start looking forward to the future and the plan of God that he has for your life. Stop letting your past define you and stop allowing your past to hinder your progress for the future. Number four, and we're wrapping up, and I really mean we're wrapping up. It's not like, finally, brothers, I'm wrapping up and I'm almost taking a, this is it. Number four, Paul wanted to make it count. Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 through through 24, it says, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love justice and righteousness in the earth for in these things I delight declares the Lord Paul says I want to attain the resurrection of the dead I press on toward the goal for the prize for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus he wanted to attain the resurrection of the dead. He wanted to see a salvation complete. He wanted to attain the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. Do you understand the upward call of God in Christ is a great reward? Do you understand that attaining the resurrection of the dead one day is a great prize that we get to look forward to, that life, our hope is not buried six feet in the ground where we're to be forgotten? But one day there'll be a resurrection. And Christ will raise us from the dead being like Him. Where we will live with Him. And we will reign with Him forever and ever. Where there'll be no more tears, no more pain, no more heartache, no more death, no more disappointment, no more suffering. But in order for us to attain that prize, church, the cry of our heart, 
and Holy Spirit, help us. He is the one that gives us both the desire and the power to do the things that please Him. May our desire, may our heartbeat be for the remaining of the year and going into 2022 that I want to know Him. I want to know Christ. Paul said, I count all these things loss. All these human achievements that I achieved, that I received by my birthright or that I attained in my, I count it all as loss because it was nothing. It was rubbish compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ. He goes on to say, matter of fact, I count all things lost compared to knowing him. Man, if that was our attitude as a church, only heaven knows the impact we, we could have in our lives and our families and in this community. And it's not until then, until we, uh, that we're able to reach the u- unity of our faith and be mature in Christ, reaching up to His glorious standard. So may God put that in us as we live out the rest of this year and as we enter in to 2022.